the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has publicly stated that Israel intends to, and I quote, to return to Africa. In the same speech, he echoed the sentiments of Theodor Herzl, the founder of Zionism, that after I liberate the Jewish people, I will go to Africa to help liberate the black people. But the cruel irony is that the primary role that Israel subsequently played in Africa was that of supplying military arms and expertise to the white supremacist apartheid regime in South Africa with the sole purpose of preventing the black people of South Africa, Namibia, Angola, and Mozambique from achieving their independence. From the 1960s to the early 1990s, Israel also assisted the apartheid regime in its campaign of destabilization of the frontline states, which were a coalition of African countries committed to ending apartheid and white minority rule in South Africa and Rhodesia. The frontline states included Angola, Botswana, Lesotho, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. The moral absurdity of Israel's relationship with the apartheid regime was demonstrated in April 1976 when John Foster, the South African Prime Minister and a man who had been held in a prison camp during the Second World War for his Nazi sympathies, paid a visit to the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, where he laid a wreath to the six million Jews murdered by the Nazis he once revered. To make matters worse, the purpose of Foster's trip to Israel was to strengthen the already extensive military ties between the two countries in complete contempt of international law and the United Nations sanctions arms embargo of South Africa. Yet just a few decades before, Daniel Malan, the first apartheid era prime minister of South Africa, was leading the opposition to Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany to South Africa. During these efforts to enact laws blocking Jewish immigration, he boldly announced in the South African parliament in 1937 that, and I quote, I have been reproached that I am now discriminating against the Jews as Jews. Now let me say frankly that I admit that it is so. But I digress. Back to the 1976 state banquet in Tel Aviv. The praises heaped upon the two countries by their leaders were effusive but also telling. Yishak Rabin boldly declared that both countries faced, and I quote, foreign inspired instability and recklessness, and went on to praise the ideals shared by Israel and South Africa, which is the hope for justice and peaceful coexistence. Not to be outdone, Foster reminded his hosts that South Africa and Israel were victims of the enemies of Western civilization. Never mind that for centuries, Jews had been persecuted in the heart of the very same Western civilization. The nakedly racist agenda of the relationship between the two countries was revealed a few months later when the South African government declared that, and I quote, Israel and South Africa have one thing above all else in common. 
they are both situated in a predominantly hostile world inhabited by dark peoples. The sheer irony of this statement is that until the creation of Israel in 1948, Jews were for centuries situated in a predominantly hostile world inhabited by not dark peoples, but by white peoples. But hey, what's a little historical revisionism between friends? And how did this highly lucrative alliance begin? Well, it started as a purely transactional and opportunistic relationship. South Africa, with its vast amounts of money from its mineral-rich economy, transformed Israel into a major international arms manufacturer and high-tech superpower. In turn, Israel reciprocated by providing cutting-edge weapons and military technology at a time when most of the world condemned and shunned South Africa for its white supremacist domination of the black majority. Israel's deceit and deviousness were such that for the next two decades, the country's leaders continued to publicly denounce the apartheid regime, even as they secretly supported its ruthless oppression of the black majority in South Africa and its policy of destabilization of most of the countries of Southern Africa. The murky and cloak and dagger world of arms sales between Israel and South Africa came to light in 2011 with the publication of the book the Unspoken Alliance, Israel's Secret Relationship with Apartheid South Africa by Sasha Palokai Suransky. The book uncovered more than 7,000 pages of hidden documents from South Africa's Defense Ministry, Foreign Ministry and Arms Corps, the state defense contractor, including the top secret 1975 military cooperation agreement signed by defense ministers Shimon Perez and P.W. Bota. After the signing of this secret security pact, Israel sold tanks, fighter aircraft, and long-range missiles to South Africa and even offered to sell nuclear warheads. Included in the security agreement were training and weapon systems that helped the South African military suppress the black uprisings against apartheid. Israeli security companies and former military experts also trained and equipped the security forces of the so-called homelands of the black South Africans that South Africa established in the 1970s and 1980s. Furthermore, Israel became an international broker, buying arms from those countries unwilling to sell directly to South Africa and passing them on to South Africa. Mind you, all this was happening even as the United Nations Security Council passed a mandatory arms embargo against South Africa in November 1977. According to Paula Kao Suransky, South Africa was Israel's single largest customer, accounting for 35% of its military exports. One of the key revelations in the book was that South Africa sold Israel a 500-ton stockpile of uranium for its nuclear program. Israel, on the other hand, sold South Africa 30 grams of tritium, a highly radioactive substance that helped increase the explosive power of its thermonuclear weapons. During the two decades of this military cooperation, the total military trade 
between the two countries was estimated at well over $10 billion. An even more disturbing aspect of this secret relationship between Israel and apartheid South Africa was the double blast that occurred in the South Atlantic in September 1979. Security analysts believe that it was an Israeli nuclear bomb test that was undertaken with the cooperation of apartheid South Africa. To this day, details of this incident remain classified. Shimon Peres, a former Israeli prime minister, was a key architect in the establishment of the arms industry and nuclear capability as the director general of the defense ministry. When he became the Minister of Defense after the 1973 Yom Kippur War, he helped grow Israel's arms exports 15-fold between 1973 to 1981. Yet years later, when asked about the morality of these actions, he could only respond that, and I quote, I never think back. Since I cannot change the past, why should I deal with it? You know, I cannot help but wonder, what if those same words were coming from the mouth of a former German Chancellor regarding the Nazi era? Has the Israeli government not been making sure for years, and rightly so, that the world never forgets what happened to Jews during the Holocaust. By 1980, Israel was the only major violator of the UN sanctions arms embargo. In fact, Israel was the only country that supported South Africa throughout the 1980s as the apartheid regime faced increasing global condemnation and extensive uprisings in the black townships. In the face of all this pressure, even Israel eventually began to relent, albeit reluctantly and unrepentantly. The key trigger was the anti-apartheid sanctions bill that was passed in the US Congress in 1986 that required the State Department to produce an annual report on countries violating the arms embargo. The following year, the first of these reports revealed that Israel had violated the international ban on arms sale, and I quote, on a regular basis. Israel was then forced to adopt some minimal sanctions against South Africa. In reality though, there were little more than public relations stunt. Viewers, if you like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Now, in addition to the military cooperation, social cultural links between South African Jews and Israel flourished during the apartheid era. In reality, most South African Jews and successive Israeli governments made their own pact with apartheid that required their silence on this great moral issue for acceptance by the white supremacist regime. Not only did most Jews in South Africa fail to challenge the apartheid system, but they also benefited and thrived under its protection. Why was this? You see, the apartheid society had a demographic problem and it could not afford the luxury of isolating a section of the white population, even if it was Jewish. Consequently, most South African Jews not only came to feel secure under the apartheid system, but were comfortable with it. For decades, 
the Zionist Federation and Jewish Board of Deputies in South Africa honored men such as Percy Utah, the prosecutor who tried Nelson Mandela for sabotage and conspiracy against the state in the famous Rivonia trial of 1963 and sent him to jail for the next 27 years. Thereafter, Utah's career thrived as he became the Attorney General of the Orange Free State and then of the Transvaal. He was also elected president of Johannesburg's largest Orthodox synagogue, with some Jewish leaders even hailing him as, and I quote, a credit to the community and a symbol of the Jews' contribution to South Africa. The few Jews who believed the silence was a collaboration with racial oppression and did something about it outside of the mainstream political system were ostracized by their community. By and large, Jews were part of the privileged white community and that led to many Jews to say, we will not rock the boat. Ironically, with the end of apartheid, the South African Jewish establishment that once honored Percy Utah, the prosecutor who jailed Mandela, now rushed to embrace Jews who were at the forefront of the apartheid struggle, such as Joe Slovo, Ronnie Casrills, and Ruth First. For Casrills, the former head of Imkoto Wesizwe, the armed wing of the African National Congress and Minister of Intelligence in post-apartheid South Africa, this honeymoon was short-lived. Of his fellow Jews' duplicity, he said this, They spent years denouncing me for endangering the Jews, and then suddenly they pretend they've been at my side all through the struggle. It didn't last long. As soon as I started criticizing them for what Israel is doing in Palestine, they dropped me again. Kazriel's unshakable moral courage was demonstrated in a 2004 trip to the Palestinian territories with these remarks. And I quote, this is much worse than apartheid. The Israeli measures, the brutality, make apartheid look like a picnic. We never had jets attacking our townships. We never had sieges that lasted month after month. We never had tanks destroying houses. We had armors vehicles and police using small arms to shoot people, but not on this scale. Whilst acknowledging the effect of the Palestinian suicide bombers, Kasrils nevertheless remarked that Israel's apartheid strategy was underway long before the suicide attacks began. He noted the resemblance of the occupied territories to South Africa's patchwork of homelands which were called the Bantu stands that were intended to rid the country of much of its black population while keeping the best of their land. In conclusion, after analyzing the Israeli apartheid South Africa relationship and the Israeli Palestinian conflict, here are my thoughts as an African and a scholar of international relations. Firstly, this conflict is about land, Palestinian land, period. We Africans are very familiar with land-related conflicts. They have been the bloodiest, the most protracted because our land is intrinsic to our identity, our culture, and our well-being. African liberation movements against white colonial rule were at their core about reclaiming our stolen lands. 
We Africans therefore ask ourselves, should Palestinians not fight to reclaim their stolen lands as we did? Secondly, the history of Africa has been one of waves of migration from one corner of the continent to the other. One of the best known of these migrations is that of the Bantu peoples that began some 4,000 to 5,000 years ago from the Congo River Basin to Central, Eastern and Southern Africa. Now, can you imagine the complete chaos that would ensue today if modern day Bantus decided that for whatever reason they wish to return to their original lands in the Congo River Basin and that they are entitled to forcefully evict those currently living there. Furthermore, Africans' emotional attachment to their land is such that the two-state solution that Israel has been rejecting for decades would not even be an option. Had Africans been in the place of Palestinians, they would have rejected outright the idea of partitioning their land for a two-state solution. Israel's own Prime Minister, Ehud Olmert, gave this warning to Israelis in an interview with the Israeli newspaper Haaretz in November 2007. And I quote, If the day comes when the two-state solution collapses and we face a South Africa-style struggle for equal voting rights, then as soon as that happens, the state of Israel is finished. Thirdly, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, like the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa and all political conflicts everywhere, has its moderates and extremists. It is the wise protagonists who understand the importance of resolving their conflict with the moderates before the extremists eventually gain the upper hand. Such a wise man was F.W. de Klerk in South Africa, who, at considerable risk to his political career and reputation, chose to negotiate with Mandela at a time when the black extremists were baying for the blood of their white oppressors with their chance, one settler, one bullet. The fundamental question for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict today is this. Is there a de Klerk in Israel? Or will the world have to wait for one to be born? And that's it, viewers. I deeply appreciate your watching this video to the end. I know that the Israeli-Palestinian issue is a highly emotive one but it is one that people of conscience all over the world can no longer ignore. Kindly like and subscribe so that I can have the opportunity to make more of these kinds of videos that focus on those whose voices are unheard. And look out for the next one.